Great. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Product School Talk. Um, as you guys know, we teach product management, coding, and data courses at our six campuses. Uh, you guys can find more information on that at productschool.com. Today, we have a very special guest with us. He's done an AMA in our Slack community with us before, and it uh, was awesome. And he has a lot to share with you today, guys. So I'd like to welcome Kenneth Berger, the very first product manager for Slack. Uh, welcome, Kenneth. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, we're really, really excited to have you today. I know you have a presentation set up, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to start screen sharing there and um, and everything. So, um, all right, I'm on it. Awesome. So Kenneth is uh, while he's sharing that um, and getting that set up. Uh, just so you guys know, we're going to take questions after his presentation, so we'll have about seven to ten minutes for that. And um, and you guys can just type them right next to the the YouTube link. So um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll let you take it from here. Awesome, thanks, Cassandra. So um, hi everybody, um, it's it's very nice of you to have me. I had a ton of fun doing the AMA like I said, a few months back. So excited to share a little bit more about what I learned at Slack because it was uh, it's definitely an interesting time for me. So. You probably know, you know, Slack's been on a pretty amazing run for the past few years. And of course, the question that everyone asks me is, how did they do it, right? What was, what's the secret sauce? What was the, the thing that sort of made that growth so explosive? And, you know, I, I'm always a little disappointed because I have to tell them, well, you know, there is no secret sauce. That said, you know, when I compare what we did at Slack and what the culture was like there to what we did at some other companies that I worked for over the years, there really were kind of a few things that I thought were notable and different and worth sharing. So, you know, especially in the wake of leaving, I wanted to make sure that I shared that stuff with all of you folks. But first, I wanted to jump in a little bit of an introduction. So these days, uh, I'm an executive coach. Uh, so I took my, my passion for uh, helping people grow into the coaching world. And so I've been doing that for the past couple of years. I work with um, CEOs, CTOs of early and mid-stage companies, as well as product managers. Um, but before that, I was in product management for 10 plus years at Slack, at Adobe for a long time, and I was a founder as well. So I've kind of seen the whole uh, life cycle of, of product from founding to growth to maturity. So the first thing I wanted to chat with you folks about is this idea that I call peaks and valleys. And this is really inspired by you know, the questions that I started getting, you know, once I, I started working for Slack, because, you know, they would say the most amazing things. And I was so, it was so gratifying to see, oh, Slack is so well designed. It's so polished. It's so wonderful. Because from my perspective, I was the PM, right? My job was to see all that was wrong with the product, right? All the things that were not there at all, or that were, had serious room for improvement or whatever it was. And so, you know, I started to think about how do I rationalize these two things, all of the problems or the areas of improvement I see in the product, and how do I rationalize that with all this positive feedback? And what I realized was that it was really that Slack had peaks and valleys. And what I mean by that is that it had areas of the product, sure, that were missing, right? You know, pieces of the vision that we hadn't gotten to yet or that weren't especially polished, but it also had peaks. And those peaks were places where we went above and beyond, where we really sort of gave a little bit extra, and that's, that's what people were remembering, right? They weren't noticing all that other stuff that wasn't quite polished or wasn't quite there. They were remembering the things where we went a little bit above and beyond um, to make the product better, to sort of show what we really cared about. And, and it's a powerful idea. So, the, the question this sort of begs is, are you building a flat product? And you know, what, what I mean by that is, you know, it's a lot of people are really enthused with this idea of the MVP, right? The minimum viable product. But the problem with building the minimum is that you're, you're not going above and beyond anywhere, right? You're doing the absolute minimum in every area of the product. And if you're only doing the minimum, how are people going to remember you, right? What's, what's going to stand out in their mind sort of 
a year from now or, or even next week, right? When they're trying to remember, oh yeah, what was that product I tried out? And I actually use this photograph here to illustrate that because I drew this from my, my photo library of photos I've taken on vacation. But, and clearly I, I cared about it enough to take a picture and save it, but I can't remember now where this is, what country it is, even what year the trip was on. I don't remember whether I was on a car or on a bike or on a train. I mean, so it's pretty, right? You know, it was pretty enough to take a picture. It's serving its purpose in some sense, but the memorability is what's lacking, right? You know, when you build a flat product, when you sort of take this picture that's good, but not particularly notable in any way, you're not necessarily doing enough. You're not doing enough to really make people love your product, to make people remember why you're special, why you're differentiated, why, you know, your product is, is doing something new. So there's a, a great quote uh, from Paul Buchheit that relates to this, and it's from his essay, if your product is great, it doesn't need to be good. Um, I really like that title. I'm very jealous, jealous of, of good titles. Um, and the quote is, is pick three key attributes or features, get those things very, very right, and then forget about everything else. And I, I love this quote, and I think it's really relevant to, to everyone in, in product. But the point that Paul was making was at the high level, right, that we should be focusing on generating value for our customers in three key areas in the product. But that's kind of big, right? I mean, generating three key areas of value creation, that could be a lot of work. I mean, who knows how much engineering that is to sort of build that up and get it really working. And what I realized at Slack was that Peaks don't need to be big. And what's powerful about that is that, you know, when I say a peak, I don't mean, you know, a whole area of the product to build out. I don't mean a giant feature you, you need to build. I mean going above and beyond in the small ways, right? Just enough to show that there's a little intent there, that you really care, that there's something that's a little bit different than all your competitors or all the other players in your market. So let me give some examples of what I mean. So first example from, from Slack is uh, around the at channel feature. And if you're not familiar with that channel, what it does is when you put at channel in a message, it notifies everyone in Slack or everyone in the channel in Slack. And that could be 10 people, it could be 100 people, it could be thousands of people, like in the product school of Slack. And so it's a high-risk operation, right? Because you can't, you can't take it back. You know, once you, once you send an at channel, there's you know, it's, it's, you, you've notified these people potentially around the world. And so we decided, all right, we're not just going to do a default notification dialogue. We're going to go a little bit above and beyond and, you know, have something that's specifically designed. So we show you the number of people you'll be notifying. We show you the time zones to illustrate the global effects, see if you're going to wake them up. Um, we have the keyboard shortcuts for um, expert users. We have a link to the team settings for admins. So we thought of all these different user groups. But to me, ultimately, that's just good design. Right, it's not necessarily a peak in some sense. For me, the peak here, right, our little cartoon friend crowing to the right of the dialogue. And what's powerful about the rooster comes back to that idea that this is something you can't take back. Ultimately, we can try and make this operation lower risk. We can try and sort of soften the impact. But, you know, every once in a while, people are going to make a mistake, and we want to make sure that they know that's okay, too. And so using the rooster to soften that impact was sort of the, the key insight here. Now, you know, a lot of, what a lot of people ask me about this is, okay, Mr. Product Manager, so did you spec rooster in the spec? Like, we have, you know, build cartoon rooster to make everyone feel better? Uh, of course not. Right? And then the point I, I want to make about peaks is not that we all need to be building cartoon roosters into our products, but that we need to give ourselves the permission to go above and beyond. Because what did happen was I set the context for my engineering and design team around sort of what we were trying to do in the situation. And then when the designer came back in his first iteration with this rooster idea, we all said immediately, this is going in the product. It felt so right. It was clearly an expression of what Slack was about. A little bit playful, a little bit fun, but also about work, right, and getting stuff done. And so that, that, 
permission we gave ourselves to say, okay, when you put a cartoon rooster in the design, it's okay to ship it. It's okay to spend a little bit of time to go above and beyond. That's the important thing to take away. Because I think there are a lot of other teams where they would have seen this and said, we're not going to spend time on this, right? We've got a million other things in our backlog. Even if it's not a lot of extra time, uh, we're not going to spend time in this because we're a serious company that only works on things that are absolutely necessary, the minimum viable product. And so the perspective on what's really minimum, I think, is the thing to take away here. Second example from Slack is around misnotifications. So like a lot of other communication software, you folks probably know, um, Slack sends an email notification by default if you miss a message. But if you install the mobile app, it'll send you a push notification as well. So in the early days, when you install the mobile app, you would actually end up getting duplicate notifications, email and push, which of course, when I discovered, I saw this isn't right. We need to disable your email notifications when you install the mobile app. And this is great because this is the sort of example of the kinds of design decisions we make all the time in our products, right? Where we're thinking about what's best for the customer. We're making some small decision about the experience to sort of figure out what's going to be right. But usually those design decisions are invisible. And so what's powerful about this is that we decided, well, no, right? It's going to be a little weird if we just disable email notifications. We should let you know. And so what we were able to do with this email in front of you is, is make that design decision visible. So we could say, not only are we going to make your experience good, but we're just going to send you a little tip of the hat to say, hey, we were thinking about you, and we wanted to make it right. And so that way, this design decision that used to be invisible, all of a sudden, it's a peak. Because this customer, who's probably never thought about the team behind making the software, suddenly knew, gosh, someone was thinking about making this little detail of the experience right for me. And knowing that that's the brand behind Slack, that that's the sort of ethos behind Slack, is sort of more powerful in a certain way than any sort of functional feature could be. So another example along those lines of, of sort of showing, showing brand and culture is around billing. And I love that it's billing because what more unexpected area of the product could you could you highlight, right? You know, who has a billing system that's sort of worthy of note or even sort of adds to the brand of the product? But this is actually one of the more famous uh, sort of peaks in Slack because it was something, a decision we made very early, which is that most enterprise software that bills by the seat, well, they have a certain model, right? They say you choose the number of seats that you want to buy, and if you don't buy enough, well, you're going to be charged overage fees, probably stiff ones. And if you buy too many, well, you already paid. You're not getting a refund. But that didn't seem right to us. We thought, gosh, you know, if you're not using all the seats you paid for, you should be getting a credit back to your account. And so that's what we did. And again, instead of just crediting it to your account or refunding your credit card, we actually sent an email letting you know. And we got so much amazing positive feedback. We've gotten so, so much sort of love from the community around these emails that said, hey, just so you know, you know, you have a user that went inactive, so we're not going to make you pay for them. That's credited back to your account for, for use on your, on your next statement. And all that we did there was really do what was fair. But making, making clear that we were doing the fair thing to customers has really been a peak for, for a lot of these folks. Last example I wanted to talk about was emoji reactions. And so this, this has become a little bit more commonplace since Facebook added reactions a while back. But Slack was one of the first to, to highlight this feature, where instead of just being able to like something, you can actually react with a sort of series of different emoji. And in Slack's case, you can actually choose any emoji from the library. So you've got hundreds and hundreds of different uh, sort of examples to choose from in, in how you react. And I just love this feature because of my time working at Adobe on the Creative Suite. because Every year, we would release a new version of the Creative Suite. And every year, one of the themes would be more expressivity, you know, more tools in Photoshop. Because even though Photoshop has way too many tools, right? nobody really needs more tools in Photoshop. People always wanted more expressivity. right? They wanted to be able to express themselves in new, different, better ways. And the thing about 
you know, folks who are sort of more in the business world is all of us, probably the most common creative act we do is communication, right? Whether it's Slack, whether it's email, whether it's phone call, whatever it is, um, that's a creative act. And so I look at emoji reactions as simply giving more tools, giving you more expressivity in how you express yourself in this creative act that we all do every day. And the power of that in terms of peaks, you know, I think is really shown here in this sort of middle message saying, hey, we've launched this app to the App Store. Big kudos to Brett and Dordis. And so many, in so many modes of communication, this would just be a dry message. No response, no emotional sense, even though it's a big moment, right? Launching, sort of going out there to the public. And so with emoji reactions, you get not just a like, but you get the clapping hands, you get the party hat, you get the fire, you get dancing lady. Um, you get to have this emotional impact that you could never have with a sort of more constrained mode of communication. And so that, that's really the power of emoji reactions, that you, know, you could look at it as just, oh, well, we've got more tools for, for how you react to a message. But really, it's about creating emotion, about creating more expressivity in how we communicate with one another. And that is a creator of a huge number of peaks in terms of people's day-to-day -day communication. So high level, build a product with peaks and valleys. You know, we've all got valleys we ask our customers to walk through, right? Whether it's an onboarding or a feature that's not quite there yet or, you know, whatever it is. So give your customers something to look forward to, right, as they cross that valley. You know, give them, give them these peaks to look at because that's going to help them remember why they're there in the first place, right? Not because they're looking for these things for missing, but because they're looking for the things that are there, for the things that are different, for the things that are memorable. So that's peaks and valleys. Next idea I wanted to talk about is uh, it's a little bit of a controversial one. Uh, and I, I, I wish it were so, but I'm afraid one metric is not enough. And, and the reason I say that is because so many people are really enamored of this idea of the one metric that matters, right? This idea that you can align your whole team, no matter the function or, or the group, around a single metric, whether it's active users, revenue, retention, uh, having this one thing that everyone can rally around. And this idea is appealing, right? Sort of getting your team together, rallying around one metric. It's a seductive idea. But especially as product people, I think the danger is not acknowledging that we have effects on more than one metric. That with every decision that we make, with every sort of change in product direction, we're probably affecting hundreds of metrics, right? It's certainly not just one. And so if we really want to understand the cumulative impact of what we're doing, we can't only look at one metric, right? Certainly there's priorities. Certainly there's ones we want to focus on for a given year or quarter or team. But if we're going to look holistically at the product, we need to understand in a little bit more depth. So I wanted to tell another story from, from Slack. Um, and this takes us all the way back to the spring of 2014. And the, you know, this, is, this was an interesting time because I, I joined just after the official launch. And what we're looking at here is the graph up to that time. And so this is, this is what I was looking at as we joined. So if you think about the metrics, man, the quantitative is up and to the right. This is what we all want our graphs to look like, right? Um, you know, the, active, the, the absolute number isn't necessarily that high, maybe, you know, 14 or 15,000 active users. But quantitative metric looks great. Qualitative metrics looked really great. Twitter loved us. We actually had a lot of positive messages in customer support, which was unheard of for me, where I was used to customer support being 100% negative. Um, so I had to ask myself, with these amazing metrics, you know, me being hired to make the product better, what was I there for? And so I started going around to the team, getting to know everyone and asking that question, right? What's the future of the company? Where are we going 
as a business? And the answers I got back actually were largely aligned, which was that it was all about big teams, right? That this graph that we're looking at represents people that were really just like us, right? These small teams, startups in San Francisco and LA and New York, right? You know, largely very technical. Of course they love the product, right? They were just like us, you know? If they didn't love a product that was made just for them, what were they going to love? But we knew that that wasn't enough. What about the teams all around the world? What about the non-technical teams? What about all the hundreds of different kinds of companies we wanted to serve? And so that gave me my marching orders, right? And that one of the first things I did at Slack was do a set of customer visits with our largest teams, including Braintree. And what was interesting about Braintree was that it wasn't even that large by current standards, right? I think it was maybe four or 500 people at that time. Um, but the visit to Braintree opened my eyes because the metrics weren't wrong. Right? They were growing very fast, both as a company and in their Slack team. Um, and they were loving the product too. The qualitative metrics were right as well. I mean, that was why their team was growing so fast, as they were really enthusiastic about you know, adopting this new form of communication. And yet, at the same time, they were having huge numbers of problems because we'd never seen a team this big on Slack. So there were all sorts of scaling issues. Dialogues weren't big enough for the number of, of, uh, of users they had. Performance was bad on a, the number of messages they had. Um, you know, the, the, uh, you know the, 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 there were so many things, both in terms of UI and performance and missing features, that it was really becoming a serious problem for them. And so at the same time that they were one of our best customers, they were also one of the ones that were most at risk for losing. And so this was amazing because it galvanized the team into action because we realized there was a bunch of low-hanging fruit in terms of features that we could fix to make it work better for a team of 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 people. And so we were able to ship some quick wins on that within a couple of weeks. But it also set us on a longer trajectory where we realized that, man, there were a ton of enterprise features we needed to build that were going to take months and years, right? Sort of single sign-on, security, user and group management. And... You know, that's, that's a process that's still happening today. But the point is, is that if we'd just been looking at the metrics, we would have missed out on the opportunity for the company, right? We would have said, oh gosh, we're doing great, but guess we better keep on keeping on. And instead, we looked a little bit deeper and saw that there was an opportunity to go much, much bigger. And so I don't know if this, this graph is gonna come through, it's animated, so hopefully it looks okay. But you know, here, we're showing that that 15,000 active users we started with, it looked up into the right at the time, but even only a year out from then, it looked pretty flat. Because even by spring of 2015, we were already at half a million users, and I believe the current stats are at least 5 million active users per day. So it turns out we had a long way to go, and we had a lot of opportunity in front of us that we would have missed out on if we'd just been looking at the main metrics in front of us. So the more practical point I want to make here is that you know, every product decision is a trade-off, right? That, so, so let's take a couple of examples, right? So let's say we're going to send an email to a customer. So maybe our positive metric is they're going to click, but we also have at least one negative metric, right? That some people are going to unsubscribe if we send another email. And let's say that uh, we've got a 50% click-through rate. So, you know, 50% of our folks click. Great, right? I mean, 50% would be an amazing click-through rate. But let's also say that the other, the, uh, the other 50% unsubscribe, or 50% or, or those clicks are all on the unsubscribe link. So all of a sudden, the meaning of those metrics has really changed, right? That if you're not looking at multiple metrics, you're not really understanding the full story of what's happening here. Now you could argue, okay, that's a simple example. Probably both those metrics are right next to each other in your email dashboard. Let's look at a more complex example. So let's say we've decided to focus on existing customers uh, at the expense of kind of growing into new markets. So our 
positive metric is increase in customer satisfaction because we want to make those existing customers happy. And our negative metric is limiting growth into new markets. Well, in this case, gosh, I mean, where do these metrics even go? I mean, customer satisfaction, that, that might be a survey, you know, quarterly or monthly. Um, so you're going to have some delay on the data. And then growth in new markets, maybe that's in a revenue dashboard. But what does new markets even mean? Is that broken out in that dashboard? Or are we going to need to sort of have a new way of, of uh, segmenting our data? What does limiting growth mean? Is flat growth okay? Or do we want to maintain the growth rate that we had before? What's, what's the real definition of sort of, you know, what we want to happen? And if it doesn't happen, do we have a plan B? Are we ready to abandon this plan if it seems like it's not working out? Or the impact is too, too big on this sort of limiting growth in the new markets? You know, especially when you're making a big decision like this, it pays to really understand what the different scenarios are and what you're going to pay attention to and when you might have to change your mind. So there's a few lessons I think we can draw here. So one is around just really choosing clear goals because I don't want to lose that, that piece of the one metric that matters around team alignment. I think that that's actually really valuable. Right, getting to everyone to know that they're contributing to a greater goal. But the issue with metrics is that, well, gosh, I mean, if revenue is your metric, you know, maybe customer support's not going to be able to, to, uh, to sort of work with that directly. But if you choose clear goals, well, everyone can understand how their work contributes to a goal, right? Because there's multiple goals and there's multiple ways to contribute to those goals. It helps each of those people, wherever they are in the organization, contextualize their work. So maybe their metrics are going to be a little bit different depending on what role they play, but they know how they play their part. And you know, I know that goals aren't very sexy, right? Especially a lot of early and mid-stage companies sort of don't get very excited about them. But having clear goals at a company level are actually incredibly critical for that reason, because it's about alignment. It's about people knowing why what they're doing is important, about helping them prioritize what they do every day. So the other thing I, I, I wanted to pay to uh, call attention to is just understanding that everything has an upside and a downside, right? That I think a lot of us put so much effort into making a decision, right? And it can be so hard to get your group aligned to decide, let's go X direction, that we don't think about the fact that well, these aren't decisions so much as they're bets, right? You know, your vision is a series of bets that you're making on the future. And so not every one of those bets is going to work out. And it takes humility to acknowledge that. But once you start thinking about your decisions as bets and understanding that you need to watch them and measure them and understand whether or not things are working out the way you wanted them to, well, you get a much more control and sort of power around sort of how you're driving towards the future of your product. So again, high level, one metric's not enough. I wish it were. But ultimately, every decision is a trade-off, and the metrics that you measure really have to reflect that. And that's all I got. Happy to take questions now on anything and everything. So, Cassandra, take it away. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that presentation and for going over all of um, all those lessons. Some really great points there. And uh, during your talk, we had quite a few questions come in. So uh, we have time for, I think we have about 10, 5, 10 minutes. So we have time for a few questions. Um, let's see. I wanted to, <laughs> to go back a little ways because we had quite a few come in. Um, but this one's from Andrea. Uh, were these product decisions based on existing values that you wanted to reflect in product, or did they emerge organically as a result of the team's values? Um, I'm not 100% not sure I understand the question. So the, 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 the question is, do we... Yeah, I'm, I'm not... I, I believe this was based more on Slack's tone and personality behind the software. Oh, I see. Um, so, especially in those early days, I mean, I, I started at Slack when they were only 25 people. So, it's, I think in the beginning, the sort of brand and what felt right for in terms of tone and voice and decision making 
was really more instinctive. And so one of the things that happened over time as we grew was we realized that it was important to not just sort of fly by the seat of our pants, but to really understand that your company transforms as you grow. And so if you want to keep things from when you were small, you need to actively identify those because they're not, they're not necessarily going to stay, you know, the stuff from when you were 50 people, when you're 500 people. Right. And so, so yes, part of what we did was really start to identify more formally what our voice was like, what our brand was like, sort of what kinds of decisions we would make, how we valued customer support, how we valued sort of various types of features and those things, because we identified those things, uh, proactively, we were more able to maintain those as the company grew. Right. Okay. Awesome. Um, here was one of the first questions that came in. How does user journey journeying play a role in some of these invisible design decisions? So can you speak to the process um, a bit more and who do you get involved in these conversations? Um, so user journey is definitely a useful tool to think about, especially for a, a tool like Slack where, you know, I used to joke we had a 37 point onboarding because, you know, you have to be aware of Slack and then try it out and then start a new team and then invite people to the team and then get them to send messages and then get them to invite more people and then upgrade to paid. And so, you know, the, 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 the journey to a fully active team was a very long one and involved a lot of people and, and, and roles. Um, so, you know, in order to make that problem, um, you know, just something we could digest, we definitely um, sort of had various kind of roles that we focused on, right? So there were people who were more focused on people considering Slack and sort of that onboarding experience in terms of helping them understand just what it was. And then, you know, a very different set of people who are more, more focused on things like enterprise features for IT managers and large organizations, and another focused on satisfying the requests of expert users, because those expert users are nothing like the folks who are coming to the homepage not knowing much about Slack or group messaging in general. Right, right, exactly. Um, awesome. So we're getting quite a few questions, um, uh, people that want to hear a little bit more about your challenges and, and what you faced as the first product manager at Slack. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think honestly, at the, the high level, the, the biggest challenges were around just that handling transformation as we grew, because, you know, most companies don't grow that fast. And honestly, I wouldn't recommend growing that fast, right, if you have the option, because, you know, your, your processes and your hiring have more of a chance to adjust over time if you're not growing quite so fast. But knowing that we had the good problem of growing so quickly, it meant we had to throw out and reinvent our product process a couple of times, even over the course of a year, right? You know, we moved offices three times within a year. Um, so there was a lot of work there from a product process standpoint in terms of what was the right process for the moment and then not being attached to it when we needed to change um, in terms of uh, kind of bringing different roles into the process as they sort of got hired because we didn't have quality or, or documentation to start with, and then all of a sudden we did. We needed to make sure that those folks were informed and felt included and were there at the right points. Um, and there was the sort of social, emotional side of things as well, right? That one of my biggest challenges was that Stuart, the CEO, was you know the product visionary of the company, and yet he hired a product team because he knew he didn't have time to focus on this 100% of the time. And right. so... You know, we really spent a lot of time figuring out just ways to build trust so that he could feel connected to the product process and that he wasn't giving away his baby in some sense, um, but that, you know, we could also scale the organization in a way that made sense. So, Right, of course. Um, well, that actually brings us to another question that just came through um, from Nada. How do you say no to features that other executives or board members or team members might want? Well, I think it, it depends on the, the culture of your, your company. I mean, I think that sort of brings up a larger question of just how, how does your team make decisions? And I don't know that there's necessarily one right way or even five right ways to do that. But I think that for healthy teams, the, the best thing is really just to make sure that whatever that is, that everyone knows it, that there's not a sort of secret way that that you know things get prioritized or that there's a you know sort of 
fake product prioritization, but really, you know, the CEO does the real product prioritization or the head of product does. So, you know, whatever, whatever your process is, as long as it's straightforward and the team understands it, you can usually adjust to it, right? That, you know, it's, that's usually decision-making is one of those things that really is kind of part of the base culture of the company. Right. And so, you know, you start with something, make sure that, you know, people know about it. And then if you want to change it, at least you can have an open conversation as opposed to, uh, you know, people just being frustrated because they're not sure how it works or it's not working for them, but they don't feel free to talk about it. Um, so much of sort of, you know, helping organizations grow in a healthy way is just about good communication and being able to talk openly with your team about what's working and what might not be working so well. Right, absolutely. I think that applies to most teams too in, in terms of product or marketing or or other other teams and part of the development process. So, Totally. Um, awesome. Uh, we had quite a few more questions come through, so I'm trying to see if we can get another one that, um, let's see, every time for two more, I would say. Um, okay, so here's another one from, let's see. Um, from Evans and a few people have asked about this, but in choosing your three features I assume you came up with a lot more than three. How did you decide which features to implement in the product? Oh, well at Slack, I mean we didn't necessarily use that that Bukai quote uh, literally um, I mean I was more using that to, to illustrate that point around around peaks not needing to be big because I mean You know, I mean I think the things that we were focusing on in the, the initial version to Slack were just being able to send messages, being able to, you know, post different uh, sort of objects, you know, sort of bring in, uh, you know, links and files in a meaningful way. So it wasn't, it wasn't any rocket science, right? So there was prioritization as far as, you know, what areas we were going to focus on first. Um, but, you know, the point I was trying to make was, well, gosh, all that was what we spent 98% of the development time on was just making the basic product work. And the peaks were really orthogonal to that, right? It wasn't that we were spending a lot of time on them. It was that those were the little areas where it barely took any time at all. But what was important to us and sort of the care we took in building the product was really coming through to customers. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, we have, um, I'm going to take one more question from Charles. So Charles uh, says, awesome presentation, uh, Kenneth. So. Thank you. Um, I have a PM interview for a first job next week. Could you give any tips? Ooh. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, the perspective I always take in PM interviews is I don't think there's one type of good PM, but I do think that when you're hiring for, for a team, you need to understand what kind of PM you are. So if I were trying to show myself in my best light, I think I would really just try to show the interviewer what kind of PM I am, right? Of, of, of you know, whether, whether your specialty is more on design or more on development or more on the business side or more in terms of, um, you know, team communication or project management, whatever it is, um, there's something that you're already good at, right? There's something that, that you're, you know you're strong in and just show them what you've got. And, you know, if it, if it fits with what they need, great. And if it doesn't fit, then, well, you've had an honest conversation and you don't have to feel bad knowing that they didn't think you were a bad PM. They just, you just weren't necessarily the kind of PM they need for their organization, for their needs right now. Right. Awesome. Good luck. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for getting to that one. And, and yes, good luck, Charles. Um, awesome. So uh, before we, uh, before we close that, I want to say thank you very much for, um, for taking the time to be with us today and share your insights. So we appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love doing this stuff. And I'm, I'm sorry the presentation took longer than I expected. So, yeah, I'm happy to try and get to more questions uh, offline. Okay, sounds great. Um, well, before we go, um, I'd love to hear your advice to aspiring product managers out there. Gosh, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, I think just, just being, being persistent and staying in, in the work is the best advice for PMs, right? It's, Part of the magic of being a PM is, you know, there's a million skills you could learn and you're not going to be perfect at each of them. So really the way you learn it is just by sort of diving into it and being the PM that your team needs you to be at that time. And 
you know, you'll find yourself growing into skills that, you know, you never thought you would have, but your team needed it and you serve them in, in their moment of need by just picking it up on, you know, as on the fly. And um, I think that can be stressful and it can be, you know, take some time out of work to, you know, sort of read up and understand these topics that you might not be as strong on, but it's really, for me, there's nothing more fulfilling than being able to be, be the PM that your team needs you to be, you know, when they, when they need to lean on you. And it's, it's just a great way to grow. Awesome. Um, well, thank you again. And thanks, and thanks for joining us for another online event. Um, it was great having you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> great. And um, thanks again, everyone, for, for joining us today. Um, as you guys know, we host these every week. So if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you'll get um, more information every time we publish a new video. And um, also, uh, if you have any questions that we did not get to, feel free to drop them in the comments and we'll try to get some answers to you as soon as possible. Uh, thanks again and hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.